Okay, so today we're going deep on something pretty cool. How people feel about a company, you know, we call sentiment. It can actually give us clues about how its stock might do. Like, can we actually use feelings to predict the market? It's a great question. And yeah, there's actually a whole field of research dedicated to just that. So what are we diving into today to learn more about this? Well, there's a fascinating paper we're looking at today. It's called Does Sentiment Help in Asset Pricing? A Novel Approach Using Large Language Models and Market-Based Labels. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so title alone sounds super interesting. But like, how does that actually work? Are we talking about like scrolling through Twitter and guessing what people are thinking? Well, it's way more advanced than that. This research uses some pretty powerful AI to analyze sentiment and try to predict those stock returns you were talking oh, about. Very cool. Yeah, so like for years, trying to capture sentiment was kind of like, ugh. like trying to measure happiness with a ruler, imprecise and unreliable. Mm. So we had to rely on things like surveys or even just looking at how volatile a stock was. Oh, interesting. So you mean like a really jumpy stock price. That means people are feeling anxious. Exactly. But that doesn't tell us the whole story, right? It's just a tiny piece of the puzzle when it comes to emotions and the market. Right, for sure. What's really changed the game is the sheer amount of data we have now. Just think about all the news articles, all the social media posts, the analyst reports. It's like having this live feed of what everyone's thinking and feeling about the market. It's a fire hose of information. So how do we even begin to make sense of all of that? Well, that's where these large language models come in. You know, these powerful AI systems. Right. They're everywhere these days. Exactly. And they're getting incredibly good at understanding human language, even things like sarcasm and irony, you know, things that used to completely confuse computers. Oh, wow. So they're not just looking for keywords like buy or sell. Yeah. They can actually like read between the lines. Exactly. They're analyzing the tone, the context, the emotion, like really getting at the meaning behind the words. Wow, that's impressive. It is. But there's a catch. Even the smartest AI it still needs to be trained, right? And that means it needs data that's already been labeled. Okay, so someone has to tell the AI, this is positive, this is negative, right? Exactly. And in the past, that meant humans had to read tons and tons of text and tag it all as positive, negative, or neutral. Oh my gosh. That sounds incredibly tedious and also <laughs> probably pretty inaccurate. Yeah, there's a lot of room for human error and bias there. For sure. But this is where this research gets really interesting. They came up with this really clever solution. They decided to let the market itself do the labeling. Whoa, wait, what? How can the market label data? So instead of using someone's opinion to label the sentiment of a piece of text, they used the company's actual stock return the following day. You know, the one mentioned in the text. Of course, they had to control for things like overall market trends. But this way, they basically link sentiment directly to the market's performance without any human bias. Wow. That's seriously clever. It's like cutting out the middleman and letting the market tell us what's important. Right. And then they went a step further. They created this specialized model called Smarty Bert. It's specifically designed for financial sentiment analysis. So it's like Bert, but with a Wall Street education. Uh-huh, exactly. I love that, Smarty Bert. It even sounds smart. So what did Smarty Bert find? Did it actually manage to predict market moves? You bet it did. And the findings were super interesting. Okay, so we've seen how researchers are using AI to kind of tap into the market's mood. And it seems like sentiment has real power. But the big question is, can you actually use this knowledge to make, you know, smarter investment decisions? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? And this research actually puts that to the test. They developed a trading strategy based on that high low sentiment factor we were just talking about. Okay, I'm all ears. So what did they do? And more importantly, did it actually work? Well, the strategy itself is pretty simple, basically. You short the stocks with the lowest sentiment scores and you go long on the ones with the highest sentiment. So you're betting against the companies everyone's down on. 
and riding the wave of optimism for the ones with the best vibes. It sounds straightforward enough, but you know the market. It's rarely that predictable. Huh? What kind of results did they actually see? Well, get this. The strategy generated an annualized return of 35.56%. Wait, 35%? Yeah. That's incredible. Most investors would kill for half of that. I know, right? And it's not just the high returns. They also got a sharp ratio of 2.21. Meaning? Meaning they were getting those amazing returns without taking on, like, a, a crazy amount of risk. Wow, that's like finding the holy grail of investing. Pretty much. Okay, but this all sounds a little too good to be true. There's got to be a catch, right? Well, there are always caveats with this kind of research. Remember these results. They're based on backtesting with historical data. And they used equal-weighted portfolios. Equal-weighted meaning? Meaning each stock in the portfolio. It had the same importance regardless of how big the company was. Mm. And that's not always how things work in the real world. Plus, they didn't factor in transaction costs. Right which can definitely eat into your profits. Exactly. So maybe those eye-popping returns are a little optimistic. Yeah. But even if you tone them down a bit, still pretty impressive. Yeah. Did they look at what would happen if you used a more realistic approach, like, you know, weighting the stocks based on market cap? They did. And the returns were a little bit lower, but the strategy was still very profitable, especially when they focused on smaller companies. Ah, so small cap stocks. Exactly. Those smaller companies, they tend to be more volatile so it makes sense that their prices would be more sensitive to sentiment. Right. Like, I mean, think about it. A company like Apple is probably not going to be swayed by a couple of negative tweets. Exactly. But a smaller, lesser known company, yeah, they could definitely see a bigger impact. For sure. So this is all super fascinating. But I think it's important to remember, you know, before we all run out and try to build sentiment based trading algorithms, sentiment is just one piece of the puzzle. You're not saying people should ditch all their other analysis, right? Oh, absolutely not. Fundamental analysis is still crucial. Understanding the financials, the management, the competition, all of that is still super important. Right. But this research shows that sentiment can provide some really valuable insights, especially when you combine it with other methods. So it's like adding another tool to your investor toolkit. Exactly. Okay, so speaking of tools. When they were testing their trading strategy, did they compare Smarty Bird to any other sentiment analysis models? You bet. They compared it to a model called FinBird, which is also designed for financial techs, but it uses human-labeled data. Right, so it doesn't have that market-driven magic that Smarty Bird has. Exactly. And how did it do? Well, let's just say the difference was pretty dramatic. While Smarty Bird generated all those gains we talked about, the strategy using FinBird actually lost money. Wow, that's a pretty compelling argument for the power of data-driven approaches, right. especially for something as like nuanced and complex as sentiment. Totally agree. Okay, so I want to circle back to something we touched on earlier. This whole idea that negative sentiment seems to have a bigger impact than positive sentiment. What do you think that is? Is it just that, you know, people are more sensitive to bad news? Well, it's definitely a human tendency. You know, there's a whole field of psychology dedicated to studying this. It's called negativity bias. And what's really fascinating is that this negativity bias, it's not limited to our personal lives. It seems to play out in the markets too. So it's not just me doom scrolling on Twitter. There's something deeper going on here. I think so. So how do we deal with this negativity bias? Can we like avoid getting caught up in the fear and the panic? It's a great question. And it's something we all struggle with, right? Not just in investing, but in life in general. You know, our brains are naturally attuned to threats. It's a survival mechanism. Right. But when it comes to investing, yeah, that negativity bias can really lead to some irrational decisions. So, like, imagine you're checking your portfolio and you see one of your stocks is down. Maybe there's like a negative news article going around about the company. What's the first step to avoid, like, freaking out and making a rash decision? Honestly, take a deep breath. Seriously. That's always a good starting point when you're feeling those emotions. Just remember, the market is a roller coaster. There are always going to be ups and downs. Right. Don't let one dip send you into a panic. Easier said than done. But okay, no emotional reactions. So what should we be doing instead? Zoom out. Look at the bigger picture. Ask yourself, does this negative news actually change the long-term prospects of the company? Right. Is this just a temporary setback? Or is it a sign of something more serious? So maybe that negative news article, it's really just focusing on like a short term issue yeah. while the company's, you know, core business is still strong. Or maybe the whole market is down and your stock is just getting pulled down with it. Exactly. And this is where critical thinking is so important. You know, don't just accept the information at face value. Dig a little deeper. Look for alternative viewpoints and consider the source of the information, too. Is it coming from a reputable, unbiased source? 
or someone with an agenda. That's a good point. There's just so much noise out there these days, especially on social media. It's easy to get caught up in the hype, whether it's positive or negative. It is. That's why it's so important to have a plan, a strategy, and to stick to it, even when things get emotional. Right. One of the best ways to do this is through diversification. Oh, the classic, don't put all your eggs in one basket advice. Exactly. Spread your investments across different types of assets, different sectors, even different countries. Right. So if one area of your portfolio is doing poorly, the others can help balance things out. Exactly. Like a financial safety net. I like that. And having a long-term investment horizon probably helps too, right? Absolutely. When you're focused on the long game, those short-term fluctuations they become much less significant. Okay, that makes sense. It's like driving a car. If you're constantly looking in the rearview mirror, you're gonna crash. Huh, I like that analogy. Keep your eyes on the road ahead. Focus on your destination and trust that you'll get there eventually. Okay, so we've talked about how to avoid, you know, getting swept up and all that negativity. Mm -hmm. But can we actually use this understanding of sentiment like to our advantage? Because, I mean, this research shows that there's money to be made by understanding how the market reacts to sentiment. Oh, for sure. There's definitely potential there. Remember, sentiment is powerful, and sometimes the market overreacts, both to the upside and the downside. So if everyone is panicking and selling off, that could actually be a good time to buy, assuming you've done your research. Yeah. You think the negativity is overblown. Exactly. It's the classic contrarian approach. Yeah. But it's not for the fan of heart. It takes a lot of conviction to go against the crowd. And a good understanding of the fundamentals. Exactly. So it sounds like the real magic here is combining sentiment analysis with that traditional financial analysis. You're not just blindly following the mood of the market. You're using sentiment as like an additional data point. Exactly. Okay, so as we wrap up our deep dive today, I think the key takeaway is sentiment is powerful, right? It can move markets and it can even lead to some pretty irrational behavior. Mm -hmm. But by understanding how sentiment works, by recognizing our own biases, yeah. and by using the right tools, we can not only mitigate the risks, but also potentially find some amazing opportunities. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, that's it for today's deep dive. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.